Welcome to the Health Leader Forge, a joint production between the University of New Hampshire and the Northern New England Association of Healthcare Executives. My name is Mark Bonica, and I am an assistant professor in the University of New Hampshire's Department of Health Management and Policy. Today's guest is Mary Helen McSweeney Feld. Mary Helen is an associate professor at Towson University in the Department of Health Sciences. Mary Helen is the author of one of the leading textbooks in the field of long-term care, Dimensions of Long-Term Care and Introduction, and is a recognized leader in long-term care education nationally. In this podcast, I talk with Mary Helen about her journey from an early interest in political science and international affairs to discovering the nascent field of health economics in the 1980s and her transition to an interest in long-term care as a result of having to care for both her father and father-in-law when they suffered from debilitating terminal illnesses. Mary Helen makes a passionate case for long-term care, pointing out the economic opportunities for both entrepreneurs as well as young people looking for a meaningful and well-compensated career. I hope you enjoy listening to Mary Helen's story, and if you find it valuable, won't you leave us feedback on iTunes, Stitcher, Spotify, or wherever you may be accessing this recording. It helps other people discover us. Thanks for listening. And here is Mary Helen McSweeney Feld. Welcome to the podcast, Mary Helen. Thank you for joining me. I'm, I'm excited to, to get a chance to, to chat with you. I've, I've wanted to have you on for a while to talk about kind of your career and, and, um, uh, and long-term care because you have literally written the book on long-term care. <laughs> So, uh, so I'm really excited to be able to share, uh, to talk to you about your story and, and, uh, and, and talk with you a little bit about long-term care. But I want to start kind of at the beginning with you. Um, so you actually have a bachelor's in English and political science from Wellesley College. What drew you to Wellesley College and why English and political science? What were you thinking about? Well, turning the uh, clock back in time, one thing about where I grew up. I, I'm a native of New York City, and the school that I went to, uh, I went to from kindergarten through 12th grade, and it was an all-women's private Catholic girls' school, and so we were encouraged to apply for uh, Catholic, you know, institutions. Uh, then there were one or two of the male uh, men's re- recently, I hate to say, integrated uh, you know, with women, uh, but recently accepted women that I had applied to. And I got into one and then my parents looked at the price tag <laughs> mm-hmm. and said, Mary Helen, we, we can't afford that. Okay. Uh, so uh, then the next best choice uh, was Wellesley. I really didn't want to go to another all women's school but they gave me a very good uh, financial deal. And I did want to be in the Boston area. I did not want to go anywhere near schools in New York City. I just wanted a change of scenery and, and stuff. And so that was, you know, the choice that was there. Again, the school that I went to didn't, re- it wasn't a large public high school that offered, you know, a variety of um, different uh, kinds of studies. It, it tended to give you very high quality liberal arts education. Uh, and so I didn't even know at that time that you could major in something like healthcare management. In fact, healthcare wasn't anywhere on my radar screen at that time. Uh, the options presented to us were more traditional liberal arts things. You know, you, you would have science and math. No, or you would have your more traditional liberal arts. And the closest thing to business was being an economics major. My strength is more my writing as opposed to my math skills. Math has never really come easily to me, but I also blame some teachers that I had in high school uh, that really didn't do a good job in making it applied or interesting or attractive because, you know, my views of the value of mathematics certainly changed when I, I was looking at graduate school paths. Uh, but so I, I always had a lot of strength in uh, my writing skills and uh, won a, uh, I won a national writing award when I was a senior in high school, uh, which I think 
you know, got me the offer from Wellesley and the, you know, assistance from Wellesley. And I said, okay, why not? That's the best of all the other schools that my parents are able to afford and, you know, made that decision. So uh, I liked Boston, but I was kind of kicking and screaming, oh no, another all women's school. Uh, But I really did uh, get a fabulous education there. And Wellesley has a very close relationship with um, Harvard and MIT. So many of the faculty that I had uh, were either um, recent grads from uh, their PhD programs or they were people that had joint appointments. And I just, uh, I I fell in love with the field of political science uh, as opposed to economics because uh, it could take advantage of my writing skills. And the econ would have been tougher because of the math, you know, component, although I did, you know, look at that uh, and, and changed my views on that later, you know, yeah. and, and, uh, in my life. Uh, but political science, really, I, I liked, there was a lot going on in politics at that time. I always had an interest in international things, having grown up in New York City uh, it is really a global city, and many of the people that I went to school with uh, were people that, you know, traveled all over the world, uh, you know, who had uh, well-known parents where the kids would, you know, go overseas and whatever. So I was exposed to a lot. I was uh, learned language at a very early age in that school. We were introduced to French when we were in second grade, and language was you know, taught as a required part of the curriculum up until I graduated. Uh, So, you know, that came naturally to me. And my whole goal at the end, when I graduated from Wellesley, I wanted to be a foreign service officer. I knew that I, you know, public service, uh, doing things for others uh, was always something that I found very, you know, attractive as opposed to, say, I looked at going to law school, looked at going to, uh, you know, business school, but, you know, I didn't really come from a family uh, that was uh, highly educated. I'm uh, really the first person in my family to go to college and complete college, although my mother went after, well after my uh, father passed away when I, you know, had finished my doctorate and everything. But at that that time, I was really the first person, you know, to go to college. And then coming from that kind of uh, first, you know, generation of uh, college uh, person, it's very different for you. Uh, It's uh, particularly when you go to a place like Wellesley and you're looking around and you're seeing, you know, daughters of um, attorneys and doctors and established business people that have master's degrees in my Parents were nothing like that, you know, so yeah. I, I, I uh, learned how to fake it, <laughs> yeah. uh, but you always kind of felt the, oh, gee, really, your father's a New York City police officer, hmm. and what does your mother do? Uh, she's a legal secretary and paralegal. Oh, okay, you know, nice, solid, middle-class family. Uh, But it would have been a great fit for a state school. But when you go to a school like that, that's highly selective, um, you get asked a lot of questions like that, you know, so I I learned how to blend in, I learned how to fake it. (laughs) And uh, Right. You know, uh, yes, but I still value my education there. Uh, I, I certainly learned things that served me well, you know, in my uh, graduate education. Uh, and so I went right into graduate school after I okay. finished my bachelor's. I didn't work. The people from, from Wellesley that upon graduation went out to work and this is how things, you know, have changed in terms of how we educate people. They were really looked down upon as, well, they couldn't make it into graduate programs, so they have to go and work, right? It wasn't uh, okay. as yeah. it is now where people are going to school and working at the same. Things have just changed, you know, dramatically, you know, since uh, the environment, you know, that you see in the, 19, uh, in the 1980s. So I went right into graduate school. Uh, I went back home to Columbia because I was told quite 
explicitly by my parents that if I desired to graduate education, I was on my own. <laughs> so, uh, you know, they, they uh, uh, had uh, paid for the college education piece of it, but anything beyond that, you know, was out of my pocket. So, you know, that's when you learn the value of uh, saving your money and working and taking school loans. And uh, so that was, I started in the Master's in International Affairs program at what is now known as SEPA, the School of International and Public Affairs. At that time, the IA and the public affairs components were separate. It was just the School of International Affairs. And then uh, later on, uh, there was a merge of uh, the two because of a lot of the synergies. But, you know, I, I said to myself, well, if you want to be an international affairs, I mean, this is a school that's in New York City and the United Nations is there and there's a lot of international business and that really appealed uh, to me. Uh, so I started, you know, um, on my graduate studies there thinking, oh, I'm you know, I'm going to take this exam. I'm going to be a foreign service officer uh, and uh, found out pretty quickly that um I, di- I just didn't have enough international experience, like travel. I, I knew one language, not very well, but I knew it, you know, uh, but there I was competing against people who were multilingual, who had traveled all over the world and had a much better naturally understanding of global affairs, okay, than I did. Uh, even though I grew up in what I would call a very international city and, and was educated with, you know, very well-traveled people, I just, would, it, I would have had to have really done more, you know, in that area, particularly on the languages. You really, if you're going to take on that kind of role, you really need to know more than just one language because of the types of placements that you could have. And it was also explained to me that some of my posts could be in dangerous parts of the world and that anything could happen to me. Had a long conversation with my dad about it and said, he bluntly said, you know, I hate to tell you, Mary Helen, you're too naive right now uh, (laughs) to really handle something like that. And he was right. He was right. And that's pretty standard for, that's pretty standard for, um, uh, uh, foreign service, right? It's not like your first yeah. job in foreign service doesn't, you don't get to go to London or, or you know. Mm, correct. See, that was what I thought <laughs> that you would go like to Western European countries. Yeah. They're like, well, how do you, <laughs> how do you feel about Africa? You know, right. uh, okay. how do you feel about South America? And I was like, well, you know, I know French, but I, I don't know Spanish and didn't realize that you really, as I said, need to be multilingual in order to do something like that. So I was looking around to do something else, okay? And uh, I remember uh, uh, somebody coming down to our classes uh, who was from the economics department and who said bluntly, we need women in the doctoral program in economics, Okay. okay? And if uh, there are any women at in uh, the School of International Affairs that want to apply to be in the doctoral program, we will certainly entertain, you know, your applications. And I said, well, what else am I doing? You know, um, I, I had taken an economics class, done reasonably well, but my math background was weak, but I still, you know, graduated magna cum laude. So I remember putting in my application saying, you know, I think I would like to transfer over and and be accepted to the doctoral program in economics. And they said, what area? And I said, look, my, you know, I'm going to tell you, my math skills are not the strongest. I said, so I'm not going to do anything in terms of international trade or monetary theory, because to me, it was just like applied mathematics at that time. Remember, Econ at that time, the ideas of Milton Friedman Mm -hmm. uh, were revered, okay? Uh, Uncle Milty dominated the uh, uh, graduate uh, programs, the way that people were being educated, certainly at Columbia, certainly at the University of uh, Chicago, those places. Uh, We were considered, you know, the Columbia was considered little Chicago, 
you know, so that didn't appeal to me. And then somebody said to me, well, have you thought about labor economics? And I said, that sounds great. It, it's, it's people oriented. It was more conceptual. I took a labor econ class, absolutely fell in love with it, fell in love with the person you know, that was teaching it, uh, was very applied, something that I could understand. I said, this is what I would like to do, you know, with the rest of my life. So the committee came back to me and they said, look, academically, you know, you're undergrad, you can, you're very bright, you can certainly do graduate work, but you are an unknown quantity. We're going to let you in because they needed women. Okay, we're going to offer you a, a one year scholarship, but you're going to have to prove yourself. And that was when I realized and I switched over, had no idea what the program was going to look like. I remember walking into my first lecture and seeing about close to 70 people there and three women, and I was one of them. Wow. And that was where I went, wow, I'm going from an all women's high school, grade school education to an all women's college to a program where I'm not in the majority, I'm the minority. So the three of us became very good friends, <laughs> uh, you know, as a result of that. So now one of them, I, I, you know, I've since drifted away, but one woman uh, who uh, married her husband was also a doctoral student in the same uh, program. Her name is Carmen Reinhardt, and Carmen uh, is now the chief economist of uh, the World Bank. Wow. Yes, she's quite well known. Now, she loved monetary theory, okay? That was not, you know, my desire so uh, that that was a shock, okay? And I had to do a lot of remedial work in mathematics in order to keep up with the people that uh, I was in graduate school with and kind of would sit there sometimes and say, what in the world am I doing here? But that was when I met somebody who really could teach math. And I remember getting interested in the applications of mathematics and economics by reading a book that was a required book, uh, and I'm sure it's still around, by Alpha Chang called Math Methods for Economists. And it was like, all of a sudden, you put the key uh, in the lock and it opened. And I was like, now I get it. Now I understand why you need the mathematics, you know, to understand the economics. And it was just flowed, right? Uh, So I was in that uh, program doing the specialty uh, basically in labor economics and in industrial relations. I took some classes at Columbia Business School. I took accounting and uh, a uh, basic finance uh, class at Columbia B School because we could do that again, you know, different time from, from now. I'm a boomer. So when women in graduate school at the Ivies walked into the classrooms, uh, you didn't see a lot of women. You didn't see half of the classroom as women or in health care management. It was just very, very different. Okay. But that was okay. I, I found it a challenge and very intellectually stimulating. So I got to the dissertation writing phase. And that is uh, when really my pursuit uh, and interest in healthcare be, uh, began. Uh, I was living at home and, and commuting to Columbia because that's all I could afford. And my father became very ill. He was diagnosed with lung cancer and began his treatments at Mount Sinai Hospital in New York City. And because I was in graduate school and had the you know flexible schedule, uh, I had, and I had a part-time job as well. I could configure my uh, schedule and my studies so that I could escort him down to Sinai for his chemotherapy treatments. And that was when I got a good introduction to the U.S. healthcare delivery system, mid '80s, yeah. when hospice care had just started, when DRGs had just started. Okay. And, and the hospitals were like, you know, 
scrambling because, you know, what you've gone from cost base reimbursement, none of which, you know, I didn't know anything about this, but what I was in retrospect seeing, it was the shift from cost based reimbursement, you know, to DRGs, and then the impact that that had in terms of treatment of people, you know, with um, uh, serious illness uh, like lung cancer. So I did a lot of observations. I realized that the healthcare field was very primitive at the time. And if you had a loved one that was very ill and needed things like being escorted to and from uh, medical appointments, even the treatment uh, options that were offered were very, very limited uh, for people with cancer, okay? So I, I became the observer of the system. I became the observer of uh, seeing my father uh, on what they called the cancer ward, hearing people in, you know, there was no pain management. The very, very, 80s was a very different time for a person to have any kind of cancer. Uh, but they put cancer patients all together on the same floor, and there were many people in pain, yelling, screaming, at you know, as you would walk through the halls. And I had an aha moment, and I said, you know, this is a really interesting field. This is a field where I could make a difference. I could really make a difference. There is so much wrong here. And remember talking to the doctors about, uh, you know, my dad needs equipment at home. He needs oxygen. He needs a hospital bed. He needs a wheelchair. You know, so I'm learning all about the things now that I'm teaching and realize there were no discharge planners at that time. There was no case management at that time. Families did it all. And I was really his primary liaison with the healthcare system because my mom was working uh, in her uh, business at that time. So that that was when I said, you know, um, note to file. I know that I'm working on labor economics here. I know when I'm I'm I, you know starting to write my doctoral dissertation, but this healthcare field, there's a lot wrong with that. It, and I just found it very, very interesting, you know, on um, uh, seeing how hospitals work, how, how, you know, treatments work, how people were treated, talked to, how family, you know, what was not, there was nothing really, uh, you know, um, developed in terms of patients' rights and, you know, everything was very medicalized, you know, at that time and you went from the hospital home or whatever and hospice care. Uh, really didn't uh, start in Medicare until, you know, this time. So families were on their own. I was very lucky that my dad was retired New York City police officer and then went and worked for the Internal Revenue Service for a while. Uh, But his NYPD status as a retired uh, sergeant uh, gave me access to the Patrolman's Benevolent Association And they were the ones that got me all the equipment that we needed. They brought in the hospital. I had no idea that they did this. They said, these are our brothers. We take care of of police families, you know, whether they're with us actively or they have retired. That's where we got all the equipment. That's where we got all of our oxygen deliveries, uh, which he needed to be on. You know, I learned about doing the cares, even though I didn't know what I was doing. I learned about the cares. I learned uh, how to uh, work with medical equipment, how to work with, uh, you know, with oxygen. And I remember our neighbors thinking that, you know, oh, gee, there must be something wrong. They would see police officers walking down the hall in the apartment building, you know, with the large green tanks of oxygen, okay, And they thought, "Uh uh-oh, something really bad must happen. And we're like, no, it's just the PBA is giving us the deliveries of the tanks of of oxygen. So we got all that stuff for free. We were very blessed. 
And I then also uh, learned at a, I was like in my late 20s at this time, I learned about, you know, hospice, okay, relatively new concept. Most of it was done inpatient at that time. So there was a specialty hospital in uh, the Bronx in New York called Calvary Hospital still around and specializes in inpatient hospice care. And they uh, talked to us. I remember touring and I remember hearing the conversations about how hospice is different from the care that we saw in the hospital and different from the care that we saw at home. And I said, this is really interesting. This is a hospital, but it's not a hospital. It's a hospital for, you know, people with these special needs. So my dad was going to be admitted to Calvary Hospital on the day that he died. And he woke up and collapsed at home, was rushed, you know, over to one of the um, uh, hospitals in the Bronx we didn't have advanced directives in place. (laughs) You know, different world, Mark. It's it's not common, right? Common now. Didn't know about this, didn't talk about it. Okay. And I remember just getting a phone call, you know, at my apartment in New York saying, you better get in a cab and get up here because at this hospital, because your dad may pass away. I went, oh my God. Okay. Uh, So went up at that time and, doctor came out and said, okay, you're the family, you know, um, do you want him put on, you know, life-saving things? And my mom being Catholic, we have to consult with the priest. I'm like, okay, mom, (laughs) you consult with the priest. Yeah. And I'm there having the, the, the more practical conversation. He's a terminal cancer patient. It's lung cancer. He's already had part of his lung removed, you know, he, he's not going to make it. I said, in my opinion, I think that doing that, you know, uh, isn't uh, you know, uh, putting him, uh, you know, on life support is just, it's not going to help. Okay. And the priest essentially, even at that time came back and said the same thing. So uh, he passed and I had my first experience identifying, you know, my father's body And remember coming in, looking, he had passed. I looked at the expression on his face. He obviously had been in pain. He had been, you know, fighting something. You know, he had uh, one of the rubber things that, you know, you bite on, you know, that was in his mouth uh, where they were trying to uh, intubate him. And so I had to say, yes, this is my father. So I looked at the body and I said to myself, people shouldn't have to die like this. Okay. They just shouldn't have to die like this. So that was my first experience. Okay. I'm still in graduate. I'm still in graduate school. Okay. At Columbia trying to write my doctoral dissertation and then the bills come in and they were significant and there just wasn't money to pay those bills and, you know, other expenses. So that was when I decided to take a break from graduate school. And I got first a part-time job at a major insurance company that then turned into a full-time job. And I made very good money working in a corporate economics office uh, and law and learned a lot. Okay. Uh, and had a very good career, you know, until the company uh, experienced some financial problems. Then I was moved over to the human resources area and I was able to do uh, learned, you know, uh, with a lot of my health insurance background, learned a lot about employee benefits and became certified in that area and had really a, you know, great career path, although stuck in a way. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. I was in one of those nice little middle management positions where they call you a director or something, and that's about as far as you're going to get, <laughs> right? Yeah. Yeah, uh, and uh, and you, you know you have to realize uh, it's about you've been here seven years and you're still a director and nothing you're not an AVP. And people said to me, "Well, look, if you want to become an AVP, you either have to train to be an actuary, or you're going to have to go over on the sales side and build a book of business so that they know that you can contribute to bottom line. You're not going to do it in a staff job." At that time, a very dear friend of mine, when I was at at Columbia, I had done some adjunct teaching, still a good friend of mine, 
uh, came and had lunch with me and said, Mary Helen, you're wasting your time here. Okay. You're ABD from Columbia. Don't you want to go back and finish your doctorate? And I said, you know, I know that my dad would have wanted me to have done that, but you know, here's this great job. Here I am, and you know, impressing him. I'm in the, you know, the corporate dining room on the 50 some odd floor, you know, overlooking Central Park. Uh, look at all my Bennies and my, you know, my office and and my assistant, whatever. And he said, uh, you know, uh, just think about it. Okay. Literally months after that, the company announces that it's in very serious financial trouble because of investments that went south. And I scratched my head and I said, you know, I'm going to call Peter again and I'm going to talk to him about going back to graduate school. Not at Columbia, but this was a graduate center, you know, the city of New York interviewed with the head of the program there. He said, what's your background? Columbia, labor, economics. He said, we can do that here. And, you know, I I said, I have all this health insurance background. You know, I know it. I'm certified in it, whatever. And he said, have you ever thought about training in health economics? I went, huh, what? What's health econ? Okay. Well, basically, it was an outgrowth of labor economics, but right. applied to the healthcare right. field. And I had no idea that uh, it was a field, right? So I went, uh, tr- you know, took my credits. I was uh, transferred down to uh, Graduate Center at City University of New York and did also didn't know I was training with one of the top health economists in the United States. I sat in a class and I was like, this is everything I've been doing in the insurance industry for years. Okay. So I said, yeah, I'm going to stick around and I'm going to finish my PhD. So fortuitously, yeah, yeah, it was just one of those, you know, critical conversations you hear at the right time to get you thinking, to open up a door and whatever. And uh, so the uh, company then shut down the corporate uh, economics department um, and then was also looking to downsize uh, HR, you know, to outsource it. So I would either have to go uh, in that job, go work at the outsourced firm, okay, which didn't appeal to me, you know, or take the package, which was very generous at that because they didn't want lawsuits of women and minorities. That was my theory, but I got um, a year of salary, full salary, and I got my benefits as if I was actively employed at the company for two years. And I said, going to graduate center, going to write the doctoral dissertation and bye-bye business. And man, that was like, you know, when it's, when you, I'm sure, you know, Mark, you went through this, you were in the military, right? And then you've got to become a graduate student, poverty row, okay? (laughs) Giving up my nice apartment in Manhattan, moving back with mom, okay? In my old bedroom, (laughs) sleeping on my old bed when I was a teenager, but I was able to focus full time on my doctoral dissertation and I was able to finish. And I was very fortunate at that time to have met my husband and he wanted, you know, to get married quickly, but he said he, he is a very, very understanding and supportive person. You know, I, I listened recently to uh, an interview with Ruth Bader Ginsburg uh, who talked about meeting her husband and uh, her husband, you know, the two of them going through law school together, but that uh, in order for her to do her training, he was the person that took care of their kids and cooked and cleaned and everything while she focused on her studies. Well, in a sense, my husband was doing essentially the same thing. He insisted that I finish my doctorate. You know, I said, well, we can move in together. He said, you're never going to finish if that happens. Okay. And he, he was right. Okay. He said, I want you to stay with your mom. Okay. And you know, who would have been all alone at that time. I want you to stay with mom. Uh, and I want you to finish the PhD. And I was able to do that. 
you know, and I lived like a graduate student. I remember my first uh, uh, teaching job during this period, that same friend of mine who got me thinking about transferring to uh, the Graduate Center at City University of New York, the place where he was teaching, he said, you know, we have an instructor position. Do you want to come and get some full-time teaching experience? And the salary, as we're all seated here, was, drumroll, $28,000 a year. I said, gee, I've really come full circle. I am now making less than my assistant when I worked at Equitable Life. Oh, well, what have I done here, (laughs) right? But I got the teaching experience. I got the doctoral dissertation, uh, you know, uh, done, defended, and then I left there. Uh, They wanted to keep me, and I was like, "Mm, (laughs) you got to give me more money. We don't have it, okay. So then I uh, went to Fairleigh Dickinson, okay, and that that would this was really how my career in healthcare began, okay. But it was always informed with personal experience. Now comes the second part of my career, okay. So I was at Fairleigh Dickinson for a while, but that was a lot of traveling to New Jersey, and I was still living in New York City at the time. Found a job in Brooklyn. Was married to my husband at that time. Then my husband's father became very ill. We think uh, that he had Alzheimer's, okay, but he may have had Pick's disease, which presents like Parkinson's and Alzheimer's together. But again, this is the 90s now, and we people just didn't know that much about it. Um, So guess who becomes the caregiver again? (laughs) Ta-da! Yeah, right, you know, so I, I, I'm, I'm teaching at, you know, Brew College at, at the time and, and trying to balance that. And he was a very, very difficult, very challenging, you know, person. And we cared uh, for him and his home as long as his um, assets, you know, remained. But it was a, a very long period of time. And I learned a lot about Alzheimer's and home care agencies and, you know, stuff like that, right? So it was, uh, again, here's my long-term care experience, okay? Mm -hmm. So I was the case manager, and through friends of mine that I knew in my teaching position, we were able to get him into a nursing home uh, out in Brooklyn, okay? I remember thanking this nurse who was adjunct faculty uh, there, you know, and was doing admissions. And I said, really, I, I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart. And I said, but I do want to say, you realize he's a very, very difficult person. Okay. Hmm. Um, yes, we understand that. Boy, I, I wonder whether they really realized that I was trying to tell them the truth. Okay. Very, very combative person. Okay. And that was when I learned a lot about nursing homes, nursing home administration, what they could do, what they couldn't do, what it was like to be around a nursing home. At that time, uh, then things had become more modern. There were care plan meetings, you know, and, and I saw the people in the different, in the care team and got to, you know, meet the administrator and learn that, gee, there are these careers, you know, in long-term care administration. So that was when I I said, I've got so much experience from taking care of people in the home, taking care of my father-in-law before he was transferred there. I really would like to get licensed. Um, I didn't do it immediately. He, He was just too much of a handful. And by that time, then I'd moved on to a job at the University of Scranton. And that was where I was a program director, not just for their undergraduate program, but for their NAB accredited long-term care administration program. So now I was really teaching this relatively new field, but I was living it at the same time. And that's when I said, got to get licensed. So somewhere between when I left Scranton to, you know, go back uh, to New York, 
that was when I trained and set and got my nursing home administrator license. And I really, you know, I, yes, I could have left and run, you know, a building or, or gone into an assistant administrator role. I didn't want to leave academia. I remember talking uh, to um, people at the University of North Carolina uh, Chapel Hill uh, and met a man um, who's since retired by the name of Jim Allen. And Jim uh, said to me, I did the same thing, Mary Helen. He said, I came into this field because of my personal experience, but he was a full-time academic. And he said, I got my NHA to help inform my teaching and my writing, my research, my book. And that's essentially why, you know, I did that. So I don't really have, you know, the work experience to back up that NHA, but it was a great thing for me to do. It gives you a lot of credibility. It gives you understanding of what, you know, people, you know, certainly do. And I keep saying to people, I think, I have equally valuable experience in this field from the perspective of a consumer seeing the healthcare delivery system at many different parts of uh, many different times in its evolution from the time in the 80s when we changed payment mechanisms, started hospice and people you know, with cancer, and now the 90s you know, with my uh, father-in-law, you know, who lasted a very, very long time with what home care is, you know, all about and care transitions and what Alzheimer's is and isn't, (laughs) right? And uh, and, uh, as I said, he was a very, very tough case. I had a lot of uh, geropsych admissions, some of the medication worked, some of it didn't. You know, it's still a field where people don't have a cure, okay? But they tried a lot of different things. And he eventually, you know, also passed. I, I might also just mention anybody listening. So my husband was raised as a conservative Jew. And uh, I was raised Roman Catholic. So when we got married, none of my husband's family was at the the um, uh, ceremony, okay, nor did they really care <laughs> to have much to do with us, okay. My uh, father-in-law at that time was so out of it that we figured the best thing we could do is just um, if I showed up that he wouldn't know that I'm his daughter-in-law, because uh, that could probably have set him off. But uh, it was very interesting. He was in a um, kosher nursing home in Brooklyn, And so I learned a lot about Orthodox uh, Judaism and what makes uh, kosher facilities different. And then also planning for his funeral, which was 24 hours after his demise and the women that, you know, came in to clean his body. And so they're interacting with me because my husband at that time was running the family business and, you know, I can't shake hands with anybody, <laughs> right? They're looking, and what was your name? <laughs> you know, McSweeney. Oh, and you're talking to us about, you know, a Jewish funeral home and a Jewish funeral. Yes, I am. Uh, right. So it was, you know, the <laughs> sort of wide eyed. Okay. Uh, I'm like, okay, yes, this is what the man needs. And now we need to, facilitate that, right? So um, that was also my introduction into cultural competence, you know, and learning about other religions and how those traditions, you know, then impact uh, themselves, you know, on on, uh, healthcare delivery. So that, you know, it was when I was then at uh, Scranton that health administration press approached me and they, they knew I, you know, as I said, I was running these two programs, learned a lot academically about the long-term care field, not really formally trained at that time, except, you know, for the the training you uh, do through license. We need a post-acute care book, okay? Would you be interested in writing it? They approached me. I didn't approach them. I went, that's my dream. Wow. 
Okay. And, and, and the first edition, you know, wasn't published when I was there. I then made another career move back to New York, you know, per my, uh, primarily because we were taking care of doing a lot of the stuff with my father-in-law long distance. Okay. So it was easier for us to go back to New York. We still had owned our, you know, um, apartment there for many years. Uh, so I got a very good job uh, as a, um, teaching in a bachelor's and master's program, got AUPHA full membership for the bachelor's program, and then they shut it down and moved us over to the business school. And I became uh, the MBA program director while, you know, I was there. But the book then, you know, was published um, and everybody liked it. You know, like many books, the first edition, it's, it was good, but it gets better and better. Uh, I would say, you know, I'm working on the third edition now. Yeah. I would say this is probably the best uh, thing. And there are, of course, more competitor books out there now. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I think, you know, you had asked me uh, about, you know, um, how does how did I pull all these pieces together, right? So, um, you know, the healthcare interest came from personal experience. And then I just fell into a uh, doctoral program in economics that offered a health economics track. So I was lucky with that. The long-term care interest really started to come once I was out teaching. And one thing, there were two things I remember talking to uh, Hap about when I first, you know, published the book. We had a big debate about the title. And I said, look, Um, I said, the book that I think is the best in this field right now is called The Continuum of Long-Term Care by Connie Eveshwick, still around, still active in AUPHA. I said, I don't believe there's any continuity in long-term care delivery. So I am renaming this book as Dimensions of Long-Term Care Management because I think there's a more fluid approach to things. And they were like, no one's going to know this. No one's going to, I said, trust me on this. Okay. Not knowing that like, this is kind of the same conversation that was going on at the time at CMS saying, you know, things aren't in a straight line. We got all this, the chronic care that's growing and everything, you know, so that, that was a smart move to do that. Uh, at that time, because of my uh, experience with my father-in-law, I insisted on having a dedicated chapter on Alzheimer's because, you know, you hang around the Alzheimer's Association long enough, uh, you, you see s- numbers of people growing that are diagnosed, you know, with uh, Alzheimer's, the number of deaths where AD is you know, one of the diagnoses that the person had, the fact that we still have no cure, we're still trying to understand what causes this condition, and then understanding it's not just Alzheimer's, but there's all those other dementias that might be even more prevalent than AD. So that that was important to me. I also saw again, through work with the Alzheimer's Association, Alzheimer's was a global epidemic. They were even saying back at that 2012, 2013, this is going to be a global epidemic. And I kept saying global, global, global. Well, I'm going to put an international chapter in there, okay? Because if it's global, and I started to do more work, and I'm like, you know, long-term care is a global issue, Whoa, nobody was talking about this stuff at the time, right? Yeah. You know, I, and I think I, I had an article that I wrote that was, you know, talking about that. Um, some people have called me, and, you know, I don't mean to sound pompous, but some people have said to me, I'm a visionary. I said, no, I'm not really a visionary. I'm a person with boots on the ground that observes a lot, okay? Yeah. And if you know anything about me, I have all kinds of little pieces of paper at home, okay, Uh, from takeout menus, okay, Uh, you know, to backs of, um, I read the New Yorker magazine, you know, have for many years. I have notes scribbled on the back of New Yorker magazines. 
and other pieces of paper where I listen to programs, somebody says something that I find interesting, I'll scribble that down, okay? And then I put them all together. I'm like, I got to get this stuff into the book. This is really important. I have to get this book to help inform that chapter on the book, right? So and that's just, I've been like that ever since I started to do that book, okay? Yeah. Um, because every edition evolves. Uh, it really is, I would really call it my life's work, uh, but I was told very clearly at my current employer, you have to do more than just the book. <laughs> you, you have peer-reviewed journal articles that you, yeah. well, that's you the, need to, you need to, <laughs> right? you know, you need to start to work on it. I said, that's okay. And someone said to me, take what you've written in the book and then um, build your platform from that. And that's what I have been doing, you know, trying to take chapters that interested me and then use those kinds of, you know, themes. Okay. You know, that's pretty much, you know, in, in terms of the career, you know, uh, trajectory. So now I'm, I'm much older and have taught for almost 25 years, you know, plus my uh, career in industry, but I've been out, you know, uh, with my doctorate since 1992, wow. you know, but was teaching, you know, on and off. Uh, so I've been out, you know, for, for quite some time uh, with a lot of teaching background, teaching experience, but I insisted that that book have an international chapter in it uh, because I knew that there were going to be international health administration programs that would need to know about this. Okay. What do you, you know, see so the major? What do you see as the major differences between long-term care industries in, across countries? Oh, uh, you know, a lot of it is more, um, a, uh, you know, in other countries, more so what we would call socialized medicine or centralized, uh, you know, approach to healthcare delivery. Uh, and so um, a lot of long term care is still hospital based hmm. or at home with families. Okay. Okay. You don't really see a well developed nursing home and assisted living industry in most countries across the world. In some you do because assisted living came from the Scandinavian countries to our country, but the nursing home industry uh, really is, is dominant here in the United States with some growth in, you know, the UK uh, certainly has got something China has a growing need, you know, for uh, nursing homes, same with Japan, but our long-term care delivery uh, system, I don't know if it would work everywhere. I still think that the dominant model internationally is home and community-based care with what we would call nursing care back in a hospital environment. And of course, hospitals look different overseas, you know, uh, uh, as well. One thing that the Europeans have done, certainly much more than we have done, they have integrated uh, hospice and palliative care and assistive technology, telehealth, telemedicine, uh, smart homes, things like that. Uh, they're far ahead of where we are. Okay. Mm -hmm. So me. that's going to be, you know, the next. Uh, evolution of this. I think that long-term care still is, I will refer to it as either the redheaded stepchild of the U.S. healthcare delivery system, or maybe behind closed doors, the hairy armpit, <laughs> you know, of uh, U.S. healthcare delivery. Oh, why would you want to start your career in long-term care? Well, you know, again, I, I've gotten students who start their career in long-term care because their family's in the business, or they took care of relatives, and that's what they want to do, okay? They don't want a desk job. Long-term care is definitely not a desk job. It's long hours. It's a lot of responsibility. But what I say to my students is, you can be an administrator of your own building, Okay, with sufficient experience when you're relatively young. Okay, 
yeah. with that with that NHA license. And now there is the new option of the health services executive license. So you are seeing young people that are licensed and they are assisted administrators and they're taking a lot on uh, a lot of responsibility. Okay. That's one, uh, of the I, that's one of the things that I found really interesting uh, when I, you know, came out of the, uh, as you mentioned, I came out of the military health system. And so I didn't have much exposure to long-term care, but coming to uh, coming to my program here up at UNH, you know, seeing the young folks that graduated and went into uh, into administrator, assistant administrator roles, and then and got their license. I mean, they were in their early twenties, and they were running a yes. building. It's amazing. Yes. I mean, that's and, and, and like that in, you see that in the military, but you just don't see that anywhere else in the health system. And correct. And this is what I keep saying as the attractor to my students is: if you really want a career where you're never going to be unemployed, you will take on a lot of responsibility and a lot of stress, okay? But if you really want to be your own boss, okay, or, you know, uh, a boss hired by, you know, uh, a corporate entity or not-for-profit entity, um, this is the field. This is absolutely the field, okay? Although I will now say I'm after covid I have a little different view of this field. And I think that we are going to move away from um, putting everybody in long-term care communities. It's uh, to quote, uh, there's a book with this title called, we're going to look more at aging in the right place. Okay. That's interesting. Um, Aging in the right place, meaning it, the, what is the right place for you might be a different choice as the right place for me. So it allows for diversity. It allows for people who want the support of a long-term care community. There are some people who like that idea of a campus living and an apartment, no house, somebody else cooks and cleans. They're always going to be cared for uh, and they have a lot of nice amenities and nice people around them. They like that and they'll pay for that. And they have the means to pay for that. Mm -hmm. Then there are people who have to go to long-term care communities because there isn't anybody to take care of them, okay? Or their needs are too clinically complex so that they really do have to be in a 24-7 setting, okay? Uh, They don't have family members. They don't have an army of people, you know, et cetera. Then, but I think the vast majority of people are going to be choosing home and community based settings. But we have some issues here, okay? Just some statistics. There was a conference in December 2020 that was sponsored by the Stanford Center on Longevity. And some of the results of that conference were published in an article in Barron's. So here is one of the things that they pointed out there. Yes, more and more people will be staying at home. But when we look at our stock of housing, only 1% of the housing, okay, that people over 50 live in have universal design features, meaning they're on one level, meaning that the doorways are wide enough to accommodate a wheelchair meaning that there are no stairs that lead from the curb, okay, and the walkway that, you know, so if a person utilizes a wheelchair, they'd easily be able to wheel into the front entrance. That's rare. I've seen maybe two examples of that, um, and these were custom-built homes that were built with that. Usually people just put the old ugly ramp on, you know, the existing um, house. But that's a significant um, statistic of only 1%. And so this conference uh, said a couple of things. They said that there is a huge potential product market for um, people who are older, 50 plus. It will revolutionize the way that we design products and specifically the way that we live and that housing design has to change if you want 
everybody to be living at home for the rest of their life, which I think CMS would like to support that decision. Okay. They also cited some pretty staggering statistics, right? That this marketplace for to, to satisfy the needs of um, people growing older is worth $8.3 trillion just in the US and $22 trillion globally. Now, if you look at those statistics, you have to sit back and say, now who in the world would want to have a job as a hospital administrator that might pay low, low six figures, mid six figures, okay? Not a million bucks, okay? Why wouldn't they want to enter this kind of market? We still have a lot of stigma. There's a lot of ageist language, ableist language, ageist thinking, even amongst our faculty. Uh, People may not want to talk about this market opportunity because they don't really understand it. They haven't had personal experiences like I have had, okay, where I know, (laughs) you know, that when I, when I talk about why should you get post-acute care training, because you're never going to be unemployed, and it's a great career path. But it is definitely stressful. The biggest challenge we have right now because of COVID-19 is all the bad news that is coming out about nursing homes, assisted living. Oh, all these people died. Oh, all these. Well, a lot of people died in hospitals, and a lot of people died in jails, A lot of people died in congregate settings. It's not just bad nursing home, uh, bad nursing home administrator. I think that there were things going on in the external environment. No one knew how to manage a pandemic. This leads me into another area of interest that I uh, got very interested in because of faculty doing existing research in it at Towson which is emergency management and emergency preparedness. If we had what CMS and Joint Commission would like us all to have, also FEMA, an all-hazards, community-based approach to preparedness, if we really, truly had that, I think that our COVID outcomes for post-acute care providers would have looked very different. Same with the hospitals. We would have all had backup places to go. They would have been, you know, hot, <laughs> hot structures, not field hospitals that you're building, right, with the National Guard ru- rushing to build this stuff. It would have already existed. And all you'd have to do is walk in and flip the switch. And we didn't have anything like that. And we still don't have things like that. We don't, you know, care transitions are... Uh, still very rough. They're better. There is technology that can facilitate that now. I think there's going to be more, you know, attention paid to that. Um, now the challenge we have is in throughout this, not just post-acute care, is the workforce. People don't want to work in healthcare anymore because they don't want to work with people that have COVID or with people where there is a higher risk of them being exposed to people with COVID, okay? Hmm. Uh, We didn't plan as far as PPE, nothing. All of that would have been done if we had true preparedness, okay? And we don't, we don't. So people want to say, you know, what's the, what are the new things that we can do with nursing homes? Well, I think admit that nursing homes are not going to be the number one choice for most consumers. The VA, I believe, has already experimented with a program called Choose Home, where they have offered uh, that option to uh, veterans, okay, because they knew they didn't have enough beds in the VA post-acute care facilities to provide needs. So now... That choose home says to the veteran, okay, okay, um, we're discharging you from the hospital. You one of two choices: rehab, nursing home based, or 
go home and we will do something similar to like a hospital at home model where we'll bring in the hospital bed, the oxygen, the uh, medical equipment that you need, the nursing staff. Uh, We will have telehealth cameras and stuff set up in your living, you know, space, you know, so that um, if something, if you needed help, you would be able to get access to help. There's a very good case on this in Connie of Ashwick's cases, you know, in um, population and community health published by Health Administration Press. Connie would be thrilled that I'm promoting her book, but I am because um, she's got a case in there that describes just this scenario. And that's what I, there is talk in the home care industry that when Joe Biden becomes president, these are going to be some of the initiatives that they will put forward, okay? That discharge planning will be different and we will have a more robust home and community-based service industry. But Mark, it's the workforce, We need the workforce to back that up. Uh, Clinicians, generally speaking, once they come out of school, where do they choose to go? First choice is the hospital. If anybody came out of nursing school and said, I want to start my career in long-term care, they'd be looking at them like, huh? But one of the conversations that we may need to say to recent clinical grads is, look, we need therapy and we need nurses, you know, in, um, in multiple settings. Okay. Uh, and we need them in um, home care. Okay. And you've got to offer them more money and it's a different reimbursement system. It's a different, it's PDGM, it's PDPM now in nursing homes. So people have to be more familiarized with that. My teaching in the spring, we'll now start to talk more about we're going to get these, you know, home instead models, these hospital at home models, uh, these ones where people who are health administration uh, majors, even health educators, will become care navigators who then can support people through this process. And you see them already in Hospice organizations, there were people with COVID that didn't make it, and I'm sure entered the hospice system. I now have a week where I talk about death and dying. And once you pass, what is the process? If a person passes at home, what do you do? Do you call the police? You should call the funeral home. Each state has different kinds of paperwork that they would like you to have filled out in advance. Most people don't even think that far. Um, And what happens now at the funeral homes now that we have COVID? You know, it, 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 all of those kinds of things we need to start to teach our students. You need to have some class that talks about this. I don't know. I I know that AUPHA requires post-acute care training, but I think that the vast majority of faculty, and if anyone's listening to this or hospital administrators listening to this, the vast majority of the way that we train people is here's long-term care. Here's nursing home. Here's assisted living. Here's home and community-based services. Medicare pays for part. Medicaid pays for part. We have hospice and palliative care, and that's about all they learn. They don't really learn about the care, much about the care transitions. Uh, They don't learn about the career uh, opportunities or the different management things. You know, the management by walking around, which is a a big component of that. You know, long-term care was doing huddles before they called it huddles, (laughs) you know, that, that just um, what are care plans, what are care teams, that was in place in long-term care far before the hospitals started to do it. I'd just like to see more of this information integrated. Let the student decide where they want to be. But we have to offer 
some kind of substantive training. And I know a lot of places have said, I have no room in my curriculum. Then please do me this favor. In every class that is required for this major, make sure that you have a component of long-term care. Call it post-acute care. In your U.S. healthcare delivery, make sure that you have a lecture. Um, in the you know management classes, uh, talk about teams, okay, interdisciplinary teams, and maybe use long-term care, you know, as an example of it. There are legal and ethical principles and important cases about end of life that you should be teaching in ethics and in law. And when you teach quality and safety, don't just teach uh, Lean Six Sigma, the tools, talk about the different QAPI principles and how they apply in long-term care and home care, you know, the, just make it, infuse it if you can't have a dedicated class. Speak enthusiastically about it because there obviously is economic opportunity. But, but remember, you know, uh, 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 this is my other bug thing, okay, that's things that really, really bug me. People still have a perception that long-term care equals older adults. It isn't. It just isn't. COVID-19 should show us that very clearly. We are now going to have people who had COVID who are on the long-term recuperation track. These are the people who will have the heart conditions, uh, the chronic breathing issues. It isn't just a bad flu uh, for some people. Some people have had it, and it is. With others, it isn't. Okay, And the effects will linger for many years. And then there are others whose system can't, could not take the virus and passed. So we have younger people who will be living with disabling conditions for the rest of their life. We have veterans coming back from combat who will be living with conditions for the rest of their lives. So let's, you know, ban these uh, words like uh, people, you know, the disabled, the elderly, use more positive language, elders, people with disabilities. They are younger, they are older, they are potentially everybody. There's a woman uh, very well known in the disabilities community who said, everybody can develop a disabling condition. Most people in one of her statistics, uh, her name is Judy Human, okay, H-E-U-M-A-N-N. Uh, she's been one of the leaders in the disabilities movement for many years. And Judy has said that one in four people by the time that they reach age 60 have a disabling condition. One in four. And warfare increases that. And pandemics increase it, and uh, natural disasters increase it as well. We also don't talk about the psychological impact of all of these. We have PTSD, we have TBI, we have whole groups of healthcare providers who I believe are, are suffering now from PTSD because of what they saw in taking care of people with COVID. So part of teaching long-term care isn't just here are the services, okay, here's how we pay people. What else should we be talking about? Death and dying and trauma. Give everybody some training in mental health, okay? Something, anything, addiction, not a lot of our programs look at the field that way. Uh, it's more that sort of traditional hospital-based. And with all respect to the hospital administrators, they're not going to fill the beds the way that they used to either, right? Mary Helen, let me um, let me let me close up our conversation 
uh, just briefly talk uh, talking a little bit about teaching. Yes. Because you've been teaching for 25 years. Yes. And you made early in our conversation, you said you didn't get turned on to math until you know, much later. And, and you said it was because of a better teacher, better book. Absolutely. So, so what is your teaching philosophy? What works for you? Experiential learning, number one. Okay. Uh, you know, you can have the best book in the world, but uh, uh, today's uh, students will tune you out if all they get is lecture heavy PowerPoint, PowerPoint, you know, by death uh, kinds of things. I think uh, certainly group work, but get people out into the community to see what the providers are like. Interview people, okay? Walk around your community and observe things. You know, um, uh, the, I've done that in quality management uh, classes. I've, I do this actually in post-acute care uh, class. Uh, people use AARP uh, instruments uh, that they have put together uh, like a walk fit assessment so that people get a sense of um, a community has to be livable to support how, you know, housing uh, that people are going to live in for the rest of their lives. So it's not just having a home to live in that's on one level that has the universal design features. You then have to go beyond that and you have to look at what's the width of the sidewalks. Are they in good condition? Okay. What's the traffic light uh, like? What's the lighting like? Okay. Uh, to the extent that you can get people out, you can have them shadow people in the field. Guest speakers are good, but I just think it's much better if you get the students out. Even I, I am a believer in service learning. If you can partner with any organizations where you can have team-based projects that can help a lot of not-for-profit organizations can't afford to do things nowadays. And certainly, you know, do things, you know, the University of Scranton had a very good approach to this. And a lot of this was because of their Jesuit, you know, background, uh, or they were a Jesuit-based institution. They required service learning for students. And people uh, became involved in uh, food drives, you know, and um, walks and other kinds of community events that raised money, you know, uh, and they interviewed people, you know, that they were involved in the, you know, walk. Nowadays in COVID, I mean, there are so many really substantive things that people can do. I can uh, tell you in my, in my state, uh, right now, um, we have uh, we're going to be setting up vaccination clinics. There's not just only the testing, where you could be an administrative, you know, volunteer uh, directing people to the COVID testing line. But now um, people are being currently trained to vaccinate, okay, with the COVID vaccine, and you can be administrative and you can um, volunteer with Medical Reserve Corps. People don't even know that there are medical reserve corps that exist in every state. The, these are wonderful, wonderful opportunities. You know, um, hand out boxes of food to people that need it. Then you'll really get a sense of all the people that need care. It, you know what I'm saying? Consider also, I, I mentioned this to a student of mine recently who said, I am I'm very interested in public health. I said, great. Can I also toss up off out something else? Do you know about the FEMA Corps? That's just like the Peace Corps, except it's, it's domestic. And if you apply and you're accepted to the FEMA Corps, you're deployed to a disaster site and you help people in FEMA help the people recover, okay? Your housing is covered. You get a wage. It's not a lot of money, but it's enough for you to live on. And they give you uh, credits, uh, educational uh, credits, you know, kind of like uh, the GI Bill thing that if you want to go back and get graduate education, you will have earned a certain number of dollars uh, by having, you know, participated in the FEMA Corps. And there are faith-based organizations, you know, that do the same kind of thing. The Jesuits have 
something. The Episcopalians have something if, you know, uh, that appeals more to people. But I think the community service piece is really important right now. We need to talk more about that. Uh, we need mentoring programs, okay? Uh, so, you know, as I said, when I, when I teach, I uh, develop these assignments that get people out in the field. It's not just write a research paper, or, you know, that kind of, that's dry. It turns people off. People can discover whole new careers, you know, through classes that have a service learning component. And man, come on, COVID-19 response and recovery. Uh, this should be the golden age of um, healthcare administration programs doing these kinds of things. You know, we should see leadership from the ACHEs, the ACHCAs of the world. Um, I found also our students like completing certificate programs, credentials, other than I did this degree and I took these classes, okay? So we uh, have our students in our quality and safety class complete the IHI basic certificate in quality and safety. Um, our hospitals know that. And they appreciate having, you know, that credential. I ask my students to complete some FEMA classes. There are two that are required to participate in our state medical reserve corps. And they've asked me, can I put that on my resume? I said, absolutely. Okay. And, you know, there are uh, free credentials you can get in social media marketing. There are, you know, other certificate programs that you can uh, do even you know, stuff in medical terminology, you know, or other, uh, you know, um, quality, you know, you can, you can get some of the lower level quality belts, okay, at um, some professional association conferences. I also try to encourage people that are interested in undergraduate research, okay, because that can lead people into PhD programs and also gives them a good skill set. You know, uh, CITI training is, is another thing. But I'm all about experiential learning. Now, I'm more old school. I'm not going to do all those bells and, and whistles with the flipped classroom and clickers, you know, what I'm saying. Now, I've seen faculty members that are in my program recently hired and starting their careers that use, you know, polling systems and things like And they're great. They do engage yeah. people. I use them sometimes. And, and, and sometimes they're, they're good. Uh, but I find, uh, you know, if I have a class that meets twice a week, why don't we do lecture Tuesday? Thursday, you get go out with your team and do something out in the community and then report back in in a, a discussion board, what did you learn? I think that people feel they see the connection between what's actually being done in the community and what they're learning in the classroom. Long-term care lends itself to doing that quite easily. Okay. Um, some healthcare finance, that's real tough to do that, you know, but uh, it's true. It's yeah, true. It's, yeah. it lends itself to doing that. So that, that really is my, my philosophy. And I like the fact that I have been in um, AOPHA full member programs for a number of years uh, because they are, you know, that required internship component, I think is extremely valuable. And degree programs that do not have it are not really providing um, a, a, a service in, you know, making their students more employable. That's just my thoughts, you know, and, I, I think our students come back from those internships and just show so much more maturity than they than when they oh, Absolutely. Absolutely. So Mary Helen, thank you so much for your time today. Oh, I really thank appreciate you. Your thank you. Thank you. Anyway, uh listen, it's it's a pleasure. I hope it gets people interested in the field and you know that we uh can move forward. Uh, to getting people interested in, in becoming post-acute care trained, at least, if, if not, you know, working actively in the field. You've been listening to the Health Leader Forge. 
a joint production of the College of Health and Human Services at the University of New Hampshire and the Northern New England Association of Healthcare Executives. Please go to our website, healthleaderforge.org, for more information or to leave comments about today's podcast. Look for Health Leader Forge podcasts on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, and other podcast distribution sites. Thanks for being a part of the Health Leader Forge community, and we'll talk with you again soon.